Good afternoon, class. Here's chapter one, review functions and models. So chapter one covers four ways of, let me just, hold on, let me grab my laser pointer, my apologies. Four ways to represent a function, mathematical models, uh, new functions from old functions, exponential functions, inverse functions, and log functions. So uh, how do we represent a function? We can do it verbally by a description in words. We can do it numerically by a table of values. We can do it visually by a graph or algebraically by an explicit formula. So here's the function machine. Here's the input X. Here's the output Y or F of X. And here's the domain and the pair X comma F of X such that X belongs to the D meaning the domain of the function. This represents infinitely many pairs. Uh, Recall the uh, vertical line test. A curve in the x, y plane is the graph of a function of x. If and only if no vertical line intersects the curve more than once. That is the definition of a VLT, vertical line test. A function is increasing on an interval if f of x sub 1 is less than f of x sub 2, whenever x sub 1 is less than x sub 2, and it's decreasing when f of x sub 1 is larger than f of x sub 2, when x sub 1 is less than x sub 2. In other words, in the case of increasing, x gets larger, so does y. In the case of a decreasing, remember, as we go from left to right, x gets larger, but y gets smaller. HLT, horizontal line test. A function is one to one, if and only if, no horizontal line intersects its graph more than once. And recall, f inverse f of x is x for every x in A, f of f inverse of x is x for every x in B, and their composite function f of f inverse, or f inverse o f is x. So the composite function of two functions that are inverse, functions is always x. And also, what are even functions? By definition, f of minus x equals f of x, odd function, f of minus x is minus f of x. So that's by definition, everybody. All right. We want to find the domain of the function. A rational expression, the domain is all real numbers except what makes the denominator zero? So in this case, x can be any number except negative two. So you set this one equal this one equal to zero and exclude that. So x can't be negative two. However, many times we are interested in writing it uh, in an interval format. So we are going to write. minus infinity minus two union minus two infinity. This is the interval format, everybody. We want to find the domain for f of x equals four x cubed minus five over x squared plus three x 
minus 10. Again, we set the denominator equal to zero and exclude that. So first we are going to factor the denominator. This becomes x plus five, x minus two. Uh, we want two numbers. The product is negative 10, the sum is three. I hope everybody is comfortable with that. Those are five and negative two. So the denominator is zero when x is negative five. The denominator is zero when x is not, is equal to uh, two. Therefore, one way to write this, you can say x can't be negative five, x can't be positive two. However, we really want to represent this with an interval format. So here's how we do that. Domain from negative infinity to negative five, union negative five to two, union two to infinity. Notice minus five and two are excluded because we are using parentheses. Is f of x equals x squared minus four over x plus two, is this one equal to x minus two? In other words, is there a difference between the following functions? The meaning of this question is, we have one function, f of x equals x squared minus four over x plus two, and we have another function, let's say g of x equals x minus two, are they identical? That's the question. <clears throat> the answer is no, why is that? We're gonna factor the top into x minus two, x plus two. Uh, let me remind you that we are using a squared, minus b squared equals a minus b, a plus b. So we can cancel out those two. And it's equal to x minus two under one condition. And here's the condition that you want to pay attention to. What does it mean? It means if we graph this, this doesn't have any hole. But if we want to graph this one, we'll have a hole at x equals negative two. So they are identical with the exception of at x equals negative two. Determine whether each of the following functions is even, odd, or neither, okay? And I remind you that when we say even function, by definition, f of minus x equals, equals f of x, and when we say odd function, by definition, f of minus x is minus f of x. So all you have to do, evaluate f of minus x in each case. So we're gonna start with the first one and evaluate f of minus x by replacing x with negative x. This becomes minus x to the power of five. This becomes minus x. And we can factor the negative out when we compare them, they are identical with the exception of a negative sign. Therefore, this is equal to negative of f of x, which makes it an odd function, which makes it an odd function. Part B. We are going to evaluate g of negative x. So let's replace the x with minus x. As you know, when the exponent is even, negative becomes positive. So this is x to the power of four, which is 
<clears throat> identical to g of x. Therefore, it makes it an even function. g of x is an even function. Let's do the same thing here. Let's replace the x with minus x. This is minus 2x. This is minus. This is x squared class. This one is x squared. And there's a negative in front of it. Is it equal to h of x? Is this equal to h of x? No. Is, so therefore, it's not even. Is it equal to minus h of x? No. So it's neither nor. Since h of minus x is not equal to h of x and not equal to minus h of x, we conclude that h is neither even nor odd. By the way, again, everybody has access to this under the modules and the chapter reviews. Even versus odd. Given the function, where is the function increasing? Remember, in short, when we go from left to right, we know obviously x increases. What happens to y? If y increases, that is also an increasing function. So as you can see over here, is increasing, which gives us negative 4 to 0. We can say x is between negative 4 to 0, or we write it in this fashion, of course, with an open interval. Uh, some texts, they may use a closed interval, but this is the correct answer. What about decreasing? If you recall, again, as we go from left to right, x gets larger. But what happens to the y? If the y gets smaller, that's decreasing. Let me write that uh, again. In this case, x gets larger, so does y. In this case, when x gets larger, y gets smaller. That's the simple definition. So as you know, over here, it's decreasing over here is decreasing. In fact, one easy way to look at the concept, assume this is a line and it seems to be a line with a negative slope. Therefore, from negative six to negative four union, three to six. What about the constant we mean a horizontal line? So it's from zero to three. And again, we really don't want to include the endpoints. Could somebody read the question for us, please? Anyone? Both A, both A and B? Yes, please. OK. As dry air moves upward, it expands and cools. If the ground temperature is 20 degrees Celsius and the temperature at a height of one kilometer is 10 degrees Celsius, express the temperature T in Celsius as a function of the height H in kilometers assuming that a linear model is appropriate. Draw the graph of the function. What does the slope represent? Perfect. Thank you so much. So let's uh, write what's given. If 
you look at the blue piece, uh, the ground level gives us the temperature of 20 degrees. And so we are going to go with uh, H and T. So this one, zero gives us 20 degrees. One kilometers gives us 10 degrees. So let's write those and they give us two pairs. Remember we want T as a function of H. That makes H the independent variable, the first variable, and T the dependent variable, the second variable. So remember, uh, this is linear, so slope is rise over run, y sub two minus y sub one over x sub two minus x sub one. Now, we don't have x and y. So what I'd like to do, just to make sure we can handle this, I'm gonna write x at top of h, y at top of t, and then you can see that y sub two minus y sub one becomes t sub two minus t sub one, and x sub 2 minus x sub 1 becomes h sub 2 minus h sub 1. I'm just going with different variables, so we don't want to mix up. And so uh, what we can do, we can calculate this slope by writing 10 minus 20 over 1 minus 0, and that gives us negative 10. Now, uh, we could use y minus uh, y1 equals m times x minus x sub 1, but we don't need to because this is what we call the y-intercept, and now we call it the t-intercept. So remember, y equals mx plus b, and now we are going to use t equal, let me write that next to it, t equals mh plus b, and this is b. So t is negative 10h plus 20. Therefore, this is this is the y-intercept, we're going to call it the t-intercept. And the x-intercept, which becomes the x-intercept is 2, 0. Just set this equal to 0. If you set this one equal to 0, you find h. And now you have two pairs. You can graph it. So t, the temperature, is a function of height. and we don't go on the negative side of the height. Now, so we did the graph, we came up with the equation, we did the graph and the meaning of a slope. The slope M is negative 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So as far as the units, units of the top over the units of the bottom. Okay, the numerator and that, that's how we get the, degrees Celsius over kilometers, which means it represents the rate of change of temperature with respect to height. What is the temperature at a height of 2.5 kilometers? You look at this formula, replace the H with 2.5, This is minus 25 plus 20 is negative 5 degrees Celsius. Degrees course in Celsius. New functions from old functions. 
we have y equals f of x. We can shift it up by c becomes f of x plus c. We can bring it down, down by c becomes f of x minus c. If we move it to the left, we write plus c. To the right, we write to the right, we write uh, minus c. If we have the function f of x where c is positive, it expands by a factor of c. So y equals c f of x. Whereas here, for example, c is two, it's two times that, this is half of that. And if this is f of x minus f of x, it flips over with respect to the x-axis because minus f of x in essence means negate the y variable. If you have negative in front of x, it flips over with respect to y. So you change the x to minus x, flips over with respect to y. And so algebra functions, again, this is the synopsis of this stuff. Uh, if you want more details, you can uh, look at chapter one or uh, the diagnostics that I put in for you. F plus G of X by definition is F of X plus G of X. F minus G of X is F of X minus G of X. F G is F of X times G of X. F over G is F of X over G of X. Needless to say, in this case class, Of course, we can divide by zero. So G can't be zero, the denominator. Uh, if we have a domain for A, uh, A to be the domain for F and B the, the domain for G, the domain of all of these functions is the intersection of all A, intersection B. The last case, the same thing, and of course, g of x can't be zero. So not only that is the restriction, also we add this restriction, okay, for the last one. Um, I remind you of the composite function by definition, f o g or f o g of x means f of g of x, g o f of x means g of f of x, and they are not the same. f o g are diff uh, is different than g o f, unless the two functions are inverse of each other, in which case, uh, their composite function becomes x. Transformations of functions. Absolute value of a function y equals absolute value of x is defined as follows. Absolute value of a function is itself, as long as the function is positive or zero. It's the negative of that if f of x is less than zero. I hope everybody remembers the following. Absolute value of x equals x if x larger than or equal to zero minus x if x is less than zero. So that's the same concept, everybody. So <clears throat> if that is the case, what happens? We want to graph y equals absolute value of x squared minus 25, and we need to know what's the process. Here's how we graph this. The part of the graph of f of x that lies above the x-axis remains the same. So the part at top doesn't change. The part that lies below the x-axis is reflected about the x-axis. So let me quickly show you how it works. Let me clean this up. So, Imagine you don't have the absolute value, you graph y equals x squared and you take it down by 25. Uh, this one is zero negative 25. So y equals x squared shifted down by 25. Now, 
That's not what we want. We want this one. So we're going to graph it without the absolute value. This portion is above. This portion is above the x-axis. They don't change. But this portion is below the x-axis. It will flip over like so. It will flip over like so. Again, so the blue parts don't change. The yellow part flips over. This is now the graph of y equals absolute value of x squared minus 25. So that's the graph. We want to graph the absolute value of square root of x minus 1. Well, for now, we're going to ignore the absolute value. And so we are going to graph y equals square root of x, and then y equals square root of x minus 1, and then we discuss the absolute value. So the very first step is to graph y equals square root of x. It's one of those essential functions elementary functions you should know this is the graph domain and range are all from zero to infinity zero is included so y equals square root of x you should know the graph so that's the first thing we wanted now the second thing we want Is, up, is square root of x minus 1. So take this down by 1 unit. So this is 0, 0, everybody. It's going to go down by 1 unit. Becomes negative 1, 0. So this point, which is at 0, 0, it's going to go here down to negative one, zero, and it will look like this. When you take it down by one, the x-intercept happened to be one, zero. Also, you can see that if I plug in one, I get square root of one minus one, which is zero. So this point has coordinates one, zero. This Point has coordinates negative one zero. If you look at this portion, this portion, everybody, is above the x-axis. Nothing is going to change. This portion is below the x-axis, and this is the one that will flip over. like so becomes the following graph. So class, this portion is the same as here. This portion flips over, looks like that, okay? So this becomes that. That's how we deal with the graph of absolute value. Find the domain of this function f of x equals square root of x. Uh, it's one of those uh, elementary functions. I've already mentioned that. When the index is even in general, what's underneath must be positive. So x is greater than or equal to 0 or 0 to infinity. Again, uh, the index is even. By index, we mean the root. We mean, in this one, this is square root, OK? We do the same thing here. We write 2 minus x is greater than or equal to 0, which means Two greater than or equal to x, or x is less than or equal to two. So it's from negative infinity to two, two is included. So 
So the domain for this one is from zero to infinity, for this one is minus infinity to two. We are interested in finding the domain for f plus g of x. f plus g of x is the sum of the two. And as you recall, it's just the intersection of the two. And I hope you see that this goes from negative infinity to two, this goes from zero to two, only from zero to two, they are in common. Is zero included? Yes. Oh, let me just fix the two. This one is like so. It's closed class. Two is included too? Yes. And we are done. So again, and if you have any doubts, draw this on a number line. Maybe we can quickly do that. So this one is zero to infinity. And the other one is minus infinity to two. So the blue one and the red one, they come together between zero and two. So that's one way to see that. What if we have a similar question, but this one is f over g of x, where we have squared of x over squared of two minus x. Remember, for this, we have the same answer, except it can't make the denominator zero. What makes this zero? two. So this one, two is included here, two is included here. For this one, you have to exclude the two. Again, because this is the denominator, set this equal to zero and exclude it. So A intersection B, except G cannot be zero, the denominator. This is zero at X equals two. Therefore, this, instead of bracket, if we use parentheses, we are excluding number two. Okay, f of x squared of x minus three. g of x is x squared. h of x is a, x cubed plus six. And we want f o g o h. So first, f o g, that means f of g of x, replace the x with x squared. This is f o g. Now, f, o, g, or h, replace the x here with h. So replace the x parentheses, x cubed plus 6, to the second power. So replace the x with x cubed plus 6. All right, let's look at the exponential functions and refresh everybody's memory about something. When f of x is a to the power of x and a is larger than zero and it can't be equal to one, we have what's called an exponential function. Exponential growth, when the base is larger than one, you can say a to the power of x, b to the power of x, whatever. We have an exponential decay when b is between, when the base is between zero and one, and it can't be one. Why is it? Because if it's one, it's the horizontal line y equals one. So this one is not an exponential function. That's why a can't be one. And so 
Some of the exponential rules that you've seen, quickly reminding everybody, a to the power of zero is one. This is the product rule, a to the power of m, a to the power of m, you add up the exponents. Quotient rule, a to the power of m minus n. And if you're raising a fraction to the power of n, you raise both of them, the top and the bottom to the power. And these are negative exponential. So pay attention to that. a to the power of negative n is one over a to the power of n. One over a to the power of minus n comes up. And if you have a over b to the power of negative n, flip it over to the power of positive. And that's the idea of a negative exponential. This is the power rule, a to the power of m to the power of n is a to the power of m n. And a b to the power of m, each one gets raised to the power. So this is the synopsis of what you've seen before you remember them and you're fine with that. All right, uh, horizontal axis is x-axis, okay? And uh, horizontal asymptote, and uh, the formula is y equal to zero. There is no vertical asymptote. Y intercept here or here is the same, zero comma one. X intercept, the graph never crosses the x-axis. Again, we're talking about the basic a b to the power of x. Domain is all real numbers, but the range is limited to zero to infinity. When b is larger than one, it's an increasing function. That's an exponential growth. Therefore, the limit of f of x as x approaches infinity is infinity, and the limit of f of x as x approaches minus infinity is zero. When it's between zero and one, the base, it's decreasing and the limits work the other way. We discuss the concept of a limit with more details later on. But for now, the limit of f of x as x approaches infinity is zero for this function. And the limit of f of x as x approaches minus infinity is positive infinity for this function. Meaning, and remember, it, uh, what this means is that when x goes to infinity, y goes to zero. When x goes to negative infinity, y goes to infinity. That's the meaning of it. Uh, we want to sketch the graph of this function, y equals half of e to the power of minus x minus one, and determine the domain and range. So let's start with one of those essential elementary functions, which is y equals e to the power of x. And we should know the graph looks something like this. It doesn't have to be perfect, but and to scale, but this is good enough. So we start with y equals e to the power of x. When we look at this, the next one we want is e to the power of minus x. So if you change the x to minus x, it's a reflection with respect to the y-axis. Looking like that. So you reflect it with respect to the y-axis, you get y equals e to the power of minus x. So we have that. The next thing we want to use one half, which compresses the graph vertically, in essence makes it makes the y-coordinate smaller. So compress the graph vertically by a factor of two to get this one. And so the result is that, for example, here, that has coordinates zero, one, now has coordinates zero, one, half, zero, whatever this number is. Finally, the effect of minus one is to take this graph down by one unit. So let's take it down by one unit. It looks like this. And now remember, the horizontal asymptote was the x-axis, which was y equals zero. Let me just write that so I want to make sure. So the horizontal axis uh, asymptote was y equal to zero in all cases. And now it has shifted down by one. So the horizontal asymptote has the equation y equals negative one. Y equals 
negative one. And this point has gone down by one. And so this one is now zero. Negative one half. So what is the domain? The domain is all real numbers, all real numbers, all real numbers, all real numbers. The domain is not changing. The range for this one, this one, and this one, they were all from zero to infinity. However, in this case, the range is from negative one to infinity. Needless to say, negative one is not included. So those are the changes. I want everybody to uh, pay attention to that. All right, we want to come up with the domain for the following functions. G of t is square root of 10 to the power of t minus 100. So in this case, as you recall, and I'm going to remind you, when we have y equals square root of x, we say x is larger than or equal to 0, whatever is underneath the square root. So this must be larger than equal to larger than or equal to zero, according to that. We can move the 100 to the other side or 10 squared. So it becomes positive on the right. So if 10 to the power of t is greater than 10 to, to the power of two, then t must be greater than or equal to two. To answer part B, I'm going to remind you of the graph of y equals sine x. The domain is all real numbers. If this was x, all real numbers. Is there any limitation on this expression, the argument of sine? We call it argument of sine. The answer is no. So the domain is all real numbers in this case too. The domain is all real numbers in this case too. What do we do here? We want to solve for t. And to do that, look at the left side, e to the power of x squared times e to the power of 2x plus 1 equals e to the power of t. The left side, we can combine it into e to some power. As you can see, again, a to the power of m times a to the power of n is a to the power of m plus n. So add these two for the left side, according to that rule. And so this exponent, must be the same as this exponent, and we are done. We want to find the inverse function. So what are the steps? What is the process? When we want to find the inverse, number one, we change the f of x to y just because it makes it easier to deal with. No other reason. So change the f of x to y. That's the first step. The second step is to interchange x and y. Again, there are different ways of approaching it. This is one way, and it's the fastest way. So replace the y and make it x. Replace the x and make it y. And believe it or not, right here, we do have the inverse. However, we solve for y. So if you claim this is the inverse, you're absolutely correct, because 
interchanging X and Y, that's what it gives you. All you have to do, solve for Y. To solve for Y, we do the cross product as follows. We're gonna multiply these two. We get two X, Y plus three X. We're gonna multiply these two, we get four Y minus one. <clears throat> We want to solve for y. We move this to the left becomes minus 4y. We move this to the right becomes minus 3x. That's one way to do it. I'm going to write that. And that's absolutely fine. However, since there are too many negatives, I'm going to move it the other way around. I'm going to move this one to the right, make it minus 2xy. And I'm going to make this plus 1 on the other side because I want to avoid having too many negatives. It makes absolutely no difference. So this one, the right side is, I'm not interested in factoring the two, okay? I just want to solve for y. So I'm going to just take the y out. And I get 4 minus 2x. Again, I want to make sure everybody understands. If I were to do the proper factoring, I must take the 2y out. But I don't want to do that because I want to solve for y. And now divide this one by 4 minus 2x. So divide. By 4. Minus 2x. That's the inverse. We change the y to f inverse of x. So this is your function. This is your inverse function. And to prove that, you have to show by looking at either f or f inverse or f inverse or f. I'm going to leave it for you to show that. Basically, if you were to do this, it means put this one instead of this x here and instead of this x here and deal with a complex fraction. I'm going to assume uh, everybody's going to be okay with that. You're more than welcome to ask me if you have a question, work on it, and let me know if you have a question. This is simple algebra. We want to find the inverse function for this one. And again, the very first thing is to change f of x to y because it makes it easier to deal with that. And this is a little bit more interesting than the previous one. The next step is to interchange x and y. So we're going to change this to x. We're going to change this to y, everybody. Again, pay attention to this. This is the inverse function. However, we solve for y, okay? But this is, the, the moment you interchange x and y, you found the inverse. The thing is, we normally solve for y and we call it f inverse. So how do we do that? We do the cross product. We multiply these two, x, times one plus e to the power minus y is x, plus x e to the power minus y. One times one minus e to the power minus y is the same as the numerator. Okay, so do the cross product, everybody. Do the cross product. Distribute the x. So this is x plus x e to the power minus y. 
Now, remember what we are doing. We are trying to solve for y. So the methodology is to get rid of a negative exponent here, to get rid of a ne negative exponent, one way is to multiply both sides by the same thing with the positive exponent. In other words, by e to the power of y. What happens when we do that? This becomes e to the power of y times x. When you multiply it by this one, e to the power of minus y and e to the power of y, it becomes e to the power of 0 or 1. So this becomes x. This becomes e to the power of y. This becomes negative one. I hope everybody can see that. Okay. If you multiply this one by this one, you have it. When you multiply this one by this, it becomes one times x. Uh, this one is itself. If you multiply this two, again, my point is, everybody, e to the power of minus y times e to the power of y is e to the power of zero, which is one. That's something everybody should know. So we are solving for y. Let's move things around. Notice on the left side, I can take e to the power of y out. In other words, we factor it. We're going to divide by x minus 1. Now, what I want you to notice, you can leave it like that. But the top, if you look at it, you can take a factor of negative 1 out. And if you take this negative 1 out, this becomes minus x, this becomes plus 1. In other words, I can write this as minus 1 times x plus 1. And if I take the negative one and multiply it by the denominator, because it's the same thing, right? Becomes one minus x. Again, do you have to do that? Absolutely not. Why am I doing that? Too many negatives I wanted to get rid of. Now, how do you solve for y? Let me clean up the mess. Now, to solve, if I take the natural log of the left side and the natural log of the right side, the left side becomes y. Or, or go with the logarithmic definition and change it to that format. Ln of the left side is y. The right side, just you keep it in ln. And we're going to change the y to F inverse as far as the name is concerned. All right, class. Now let's look at laws. If V is larger than zero and V can't be one, just like the definition of an exponential, exponential Y equals log X base B is equivalent to x being b to the power of y. And that's the idea. If we can go from one format to the next, we have an easy time with logs. In other words, logs is simply an exponent. So So if somebody asks you, let's see if I can make this work, this pen. Uh, what is log eight base two? It's the same as saying two to what exponent equals eight? As you know, the answer to both of them is three, meaning log is simply an exponent. Now,
Look at the arrow that I'm going to put here. B to the power of y is x. In both cases, B is the base. In both cases, y is the exponent. Let's look at these properties, refreshing everyone's memory, log one, regardless of the base is zero, because b to the power of zero is one, log b base b is one. These two, okay, first, this is by this format. These two refer to the fact that logarithmic functions and exponential functions are inverse of each other, therefore, log of b to the power of x when the base is b is x, b to the power of log x base b is equal to x. We've looked at the proof of that in algebra. And this is the product rule, log of x, y is log x plus log y, as long as, have the same, as long as they have the same base, namely b. Log of x over y is log x minus log y, as long as they have the same base. Log of x to the power of n is n log x, as long as they have the same base. Now, this is the general formula. If we go to natural log, the base is e, so y equals ln x means e to the power of y equals x. And for example, log 1 base b becomes ln 1 is 0. Now if you look at this one, log b base b is 1, that means these two must be the same. And remember, the moment we use ln, that means the base is e, so ln e is 1, and the rest of them follow. You have to be very comfortable with logarithmic uh, properties and look at these two again just like these two. ln of e to the power of x is x, e to the power of ln x is x, and the rest of them are just like the last three. What about common log? In the case of a common log, everybody, in the case of a common log, the base is 10. So when we say y equals log x, Imagine you have a base 10 here, therefore 10 to the power of y is x. And so log one base b is equal to zero, you don't have to write the base. Log b base b is one, since the base is 10, you must write log of 10. And these two again, just like this one and this one refer to the fact that logarithmic functions and exponential functions are inverse of each other, the others, are pretty straightforward. We are going to add to this change of a base formula. Log x base b is log x over log b with any base, in general a. Specifically, if we don't have the base, that means common log, or we use a ln, the ratio is the same, and we use that because not every calculator can handle something like that. And again, reminding you, that exponential functions and logarithmic functions are inverse functions. Therefore, they are symmetric with respect to the line y equals x. y equals x. All right, we want to use those logarithmic properties to write this as a single log. One third ln of x plus two cubed plus one half brackets ln x minus ln of x squared plus three x plus two quantity squared close bracket. How do we put them into a single log? First and foremost, notice. This one third, if I get rid of it, I can multiply it here, which makes the exponent one. So this is ln of x plus two. Secondly, I can get rid of the brackets. This has a one half, this has a one half in front of it, okay? So, this is ln of x plus two. This one, one half ln x, I can put the one half as the exponent here. And this one, one half times two makes it one. So again, this one, one third times three makes the exponent one. This one, one half becomes the exponent. This one, one half times two is makes the exponent one.
because we have a plus sign, we can combine these two into ln of x plus two times square root of x. And since there's a negative, so you, you can write these two class. Again, you don't have to take that many steps. Ln. of x plus two times square root of x. Now the second part, I'm gonna cut that let me, into two pieces because I can factor this into x plus two and x plus one. And this goes and becomes the denominator here, right? What am I looking at? I'm looking at number six, everybody. Log of x over y is log of x minus log of y as long as as long as they have the same base. So ln of x plus two square root of x minus this puts the ln in the ratio format. And the reason I put this in a factored format so I can get rid of the x plus two. And now it's a single log as the final answer. What about this one? Well, uh, if I want to do it in uh, two steps, this is ln of x plus y times x minus y. And this one is minus ln of z to the power of 10. This is x squared minus y squared. So ln of x squared minus y squared because of the negative sign again going with this over z to the power of 10. Over z to the power of 10. What if we want to go back and we want to expand? Well, please understand when we say the square root, that means to the power of one half. Then you can put the one half in front. Let me, you can cross this out and put it in front. Half of log of x minus one over x plus one. And this one, this one can be expanded as log of the top minus log of the bottom. So, uh, we have many properties here, and we use them. The product rule, the quotient rule, the power rule, you name it, or the reverse process of those. We want to solve this equation, starting with ln of x squared minus 1 equals 3. All we have to do, go to the definition. Remember, when we have ln, the base is e. So think about the arrow that I told you. So e cubed is x squared minus 1, or x squared minus 1 is e cubed. Move the negative 1 and make it positive 1 on the other side. And x is the square root of that with a plus and minus sign with both signs. Can we use both? The answer is yes. Why? Because you're squaring it and both of them becomes positive. Remember, your argument must be positive. When you're looking at logarithmic functions, the argument must be positive. But this one gets squared up and it becomes positive. You have nothing to worry about. For this one, you need to notice that e to the power of x to the second power is e to the power of 2x. Therefore, you can factor it as e to the power of x minus 1 times e to the power of x minus 2. If you have a difficult time seeing that, 
you can set y, for example, equals e to the power of x. And now you have y squared minus 3y plus 2 equal to 0. Factor this one as y minus 1, y minus 2. And then replace the y with e to the power of x. Uh, so the first one says e to the power of x is 1. The second one says it's 2. And what this means, x is ln 1. This means x is ln 2. And ln 1, everybody should know, is 0. So according to this, ln 1, which is 0. According to this, ln 2. Now, one thing I want to add, uh, if you happen to have, and we don't have it yet, but just for the sake of argument, if any of those somehow, for example, if we had, let's say, e to the power of x plus 2 for the sake of argument, when you set it equal to 0, e to the power of x is minus 2, this has no solutions, okay? Phi meaning no solutions, okay? Because e to the power of x, remember, the range is from 0 to infinity, and it can't be 0. Even if it's 0, it doesn't have any answer. All right. We want to continue solving. And again, imagine this is uh, y. So e to the power of 1 is y. e to the power of 1 is ln x. OK, if it's easier, you can write y is e to the power of 1. And of course, that means ln x. Again, do it. So x is e to the power of e. I hope uh, nobody has any problem with basic logarithmic properties. <clears throat> All right. For part b, We want to solve for x. And to do that, we're going to divide both sides by e to the power of bx. Let me show you. So you're going to divide this like so. And the left side, using the exponential rules, is e to the power of ax. minus bx. So I can factor out the x and I get a minus b times x. Now, we want to go to the logarithmic format of this expression. Logarithmic format of this expression. One way, uh, you can take a natural log of both sides. If you take natural log of the left, becomes a minus b times x. Natural log of the right becomes ln c. Divide both sides by a minus b. And we are done. So this is how you solve it. All right, we want to solve this equation anytime we have logarithmic equation where we have a bunch of logs, one bunch of numbers. We bring all the logs together, all the numbers together. Therefore, we're going to move this. So we get ln of 2x plus 1 plus ln x is 2. We combine them as a product rule, ln of x times 2x plus 1. So we multiply this expression by this expression. Doesn't matter which one you put first. I'm going to put x first. In essence, you're dealing with this. And remember the arrow. So the argument is e squared.
distribute the x and move the e squared to the left. And now you're dealing with a quadratic function. Quadratic function. ax squared plus bx plus c is zero. x is minus b plus minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a, and you want to solve it in this fashion. What is a? 2. What is b? 1. What is c? Precisely negative e squared. Okay. Now plug in. Quadratic formula. Plug in. So x is minus b. Minus 1. Plus minus the square root of b squared. 1 squared is 1. Minus 4. Times a which is 2. Times c which is minus e squared. So what do we get? Well, this is 1. This is 8, so minus 8 times minus plus 8e e squared, and this is 4. Now, we're going to leave it as that as exact, but here's what I want you to pay attention to. In calculus, we always go with the exact answer unless otherwise mentioned. Can we accept, do you understand that there are two solutions? Can we accept both solutions? And the answer is no. One of them is minus one, minus this expression, one plus eight e squared over four. One of them is minus one plus this expression over four. The one with the negative, everybody agrees that makes this expression negative. And this one, this expression, everybody. Uh, minus one minus the square root of one plus eight e squared over four. This expression is negative, not acceptable. Why not? When you go back to the original equation, this argument must be positive. This argument must be positive, so it's easy to deal with. X must be positive. This is out, so the only positive one acceptable. And by the way, this expression is positive. So this is the only acceptable solution. Again, two solutions, only one of them works because you should always go back and check. And as far as logs are concerned, the argument of each log must be positive because the basic log has a domain x larger than zero. All right. We want to prove that cosine of a sine inverse of x is square root of 1 minus x squared. Inverse trigonometric functions is of interest to us here. Well, this represents an arc or angle such as alpha, beta, gamma. So if you call this theta, you're looking for cosine theta. So if this is theta, if sine inverse of x is theta, by definition of inverse function, sine theta must be x. Right? So one more time. Cosine of sine inverse. Sine inverse represents an arc or an angle. So if this is an arc of theta or angle of theta, so sine inverse of x is theta, by definition of inverse function, sine of theta becomes x. What is cosine theta? Everybody remembers sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. Therefore, sine 
is plus minus square root of one minus cosine squared and cosine is plus minus square root of one minus sine squared according to this. We want cosine theta, this is the answer. Both or just one of them, just the positive one. Why is that? As you know, when you deal with sine inverse, the restriction on the domain, because none of the trigonometric functions are one-to-one. -one. You restrict the domain from negative pi over two to pi over two to make it one-to-one. -one. And in the fourth quadrant, as well as the first quadrant, cosine is always positive. That's why two answers, only the positive one works. Again, some basic trigonometric ideas. What about this one? We are interested in the sine of two arc cosine x. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to let arc cosine x be something, alpha, beta, gamma, in this case, let's say theta. Then by definition of the inverse function, it's the same class, instead of that, as you remember, you could write this, or you can write cosine inverse of x. It, it's the same thing, right? Uh, by definition, therefore, just as we wrote it here, cosine theta equals x. So what we are looking at, sine of two or cosine x is the same as sine of two theta. One of those basic identities in trigonometry, we remember sine two theta must be two sine theta cosine theta. If so, we need sine theta as well as cosine theta. We have cosine theta as x, but we don't have sine theta yet. So plus minus the square root of one minus cosine square theta, right? From the fact that we have this one of, this is called a Pythagorean identity, by the way. In trigonometry. And so we replace the cosine with x, we replace the sine with one of those, which one? The positive one. And we put the x in front. 2x squared of 1 minus x squared. Now the question is why did we do that? There are two answers here. How come we put one? The same thing that we explained here. Cosine function is not uh, a one-to-one -one function unless we do the restriction and the restriction is from zero to pi. So that gives us the first and the second quadrant. In the first and second quadrant, both sign is positive. And that's why you choose the positive of the two. And that's it class.